We are going to we're going to get started. And as with all of these modules, um, it is going to be um, sorry is going to be uh, recorded and will be up on the TDSB PCEO uh, YouTube channel in um, a week or two. This is one of four uh, modules for school council chairs, but it's also open to vice chairs, school council members, principals, teachers, um, anybody who is interested in learning about school councils. To those of you who were with me last night, uh, welcome back. I appreciate the uh, stick to itiveness. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, this evening is going to be a little bit longer than last night's uh, session, but I am going to try. I recognize that you're all um, probably tired and would like to just relax. So I'm going to try to finish um, probably to be a little bit over an hour, um, depending on the number of questions. So uh, let's get started. And um, of course, that's not going to go, is it? Sorry, I always have some little problem. There we go. All right. So as I said, um, as I said last night, I'll repeat tonight, the parent and community and uh, engagement office at the board would like council chairs and co-chairs and vice chairs to really start thinking of themselves as leaders. And these four modules are meant to give you the information and the strategies that you will need to feel comfortable as a leader. Last night, we looked at the basics. We examined regular regulation 612 and what it means for you as a leader. And tonight, as I said, we're going to look at some ideas of how you can lead meetings. My name is Nancy Angevine Sands. I'm a parent and caregiver engagement consultant and a vendor with the board, and I'm linked with the PCEO this year to support school councils. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll find the various ways to uh, contact me, um, and, and feel free to do so if you have any questions. Uh, I know I personally always think of something the next day that I should have asked. So let's get started. We'll begin with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples. The agenda this evening, we're going to look at what makes an effective meeting. We're going to spend some time looking at ways that you can lead decision-making at a meeting. Um, the value of committees, and then finally, the one that makes uh, all school chairs go, oh, we, why me, um, how to manage conflict. So as a school leader, how can you ensure that your meetings are effective? Well, first of all, make sure that accurate minutes are kept and distributed to the parent caregiver a body that annual uh, elections occur within 30 days of the start of school as prescribed in Regulation 612, that you use effective communication strategies, both with your council, with the educators in your school, and of course, with your parent caregiver community and the community at large, and that you complete all of the required uh, reports. Um, that's an annual report and your PSAB, which is your financial report. That you maintain workable, up-to-date bylaws. And that the school council um, follows a written code of conduct. <clears throat> you can find a uh, code of conduct and code of ethics both in the school council handbook and um, on the TDSB website. If you just go on the website and... Um, put in a search engine code of conduct or code of ethics, uh, up one will pop. So how do we lead effective meetings? Um, many of us, if it's the first time as a chair, we have like no idea what we're doing. So the first thing, I just some, some simplistic things is post the school council agenda several days in advance of the meeting. Remind the participants of the rules of order as they've been established. Usually that's a code of conduct. Make sure that your meetings start and end on time. 
When we do that, we encourage the participants who come to our meetings to learn and listen and participate. We encourage them to come back again. Keep your opening mark remarks brief. And those remarks should be an outline of what you hope to cover in the time allotted for the meeting. Summarize the main points of every item on the, um, on the agenda before moving to the next item or before voting. So sometimes you will have a discussion before a vote or a consensus opinion. As the chair, you should summarize the main points so that everybody, they haven't been lost in, in the discussion. And um, when there are any reports being made or decisions, um, uh, items that come up through the council, before you move on to the next one, just summarize what's been said so everybody's on the same page. Uh, make sure you keep to the agenda and to the guidelines that you may have established. Some people, when they do their agenda, and we're going to look at this in a bit more later, they put a time for each section. Some just say we're starting at 6.30 and we're ending at 8 o'clock. Just keep your eye on, on the clock like I'm going to try and do this evening. And during discussions, maintain a speaker's list. Um, that may mean that your vice chair or your co-chair, one of their jobs is to maintain a speaker's list, but this is done to ensure that nobody monopolizes the conversation, that someone doesn't get to put their hand up and speak two or three times while others aren't um, getting a chance to speak, and it encourages everybody to participate. I see your question has come in on the Q&A, and um, it reminds me, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm sorry. If you have any questions, please put them under Q&A. The chat has been disabled. Put them under Q&A, and I will answer them at the end of this presentation. So what can your members and the participants that come to your meeting, what can they do? Well, they can all agree to address one item at a time to speak briefly and to the point, to strive to create an atmosphere of respect and trust and acceptance. And sometimes that means we have to sit in our discomfort and allow the person who's speaking and saying something that we don't agree with to respect their opinion, to, their, their right to have that opinion. And they must also agree to resolve issues in a reasonable time frame or table them for the next meeting. And I'm going to talk more about tabling motions in, in a few minutes. So we're going to take, I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to look at the agenda. What is the agenda? As most of you already know, it's a list of what's going to be discussed and the order that those items will come up. The agenda is created by the chair in consultation with the principal, any committee chairs and school council members. Um, it's a good idea to establish a practice to meet with your principal a week or two before the next council meeting to discuss what you have thinking should be on the agenda and what they think that should be on the agenda to share information of what each of you have heard in the school or in the community, what issues seem to be coming up and is this council meeting the place to address them. Um, also, you want to um, we talked last night about the, the roles and responsibilities of each member of council. And one of their roles and responsibilities is to talk to the people, um, to their peers. So parents and caregivers would talk to parents and caregivers in the community. Teachers and non-teacher reps would talk to their peers. And so I would hope that if your members are hearing things that they think maybe should be addressed at a council meeting, that they will come forward to you or you will send something out asking them, is there anything that's come up? The agenda should contain a welcome, especially for anyone that you notice is new there. And it's always a good idea. You might want to have a school council member or two. It's their job to greet new members at the door and welcome them and show them where to sit, make sure they have a tea or a coffee refreshment of some kind. Um, if um, you might, you may want to review the conflict of interest rules. Um, that conflict of interest um, is 
uh, I, I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to discuss it later. So, um, and if I don't, someone put a question in the Q and A for it. But I, I want to want to go over it twice. Um, it should contain an acceptance of the uh, a vote to accept the previous minutes and a list of any matters that have arisen from those previous minutes. The reports that you're going to get from the principals, the teachers, committees, whomever. And then, uh, if possible, a, a spot for new business. Now, I hope that you can see this. Um, this is a sample agenda that comes from the school council handbook. Um, you can see that it begins with a welcome in addition and business arising. Um, it uh, then moves on to old business, which I would kind of link with business arising, but anything that's come up from the past that needs to be resolved now or to update the council on the status of where that particular item is. Then it moves on to new business and then the principal's report and then any other reports that have to be made. Um, you'll notice that in this agenda, they have given a time limit and they've added that to the agenda. If you're gonna use time limits for each section, put it on the agenda so everybody knows how much time they have. Um, it may take you a couple of meetings to massage those time limits and get them right. Um, if you find that you have drastically underestimated the time that you've allotted for one section, then I would stop and I would ask the council, do they mind extending this portion of the agenda for X number of minutes, another five or 10 minutes, and see what the consensus is around that. So let's talk about minutes. Um, a lot of people are a little bit nervous about minutes and sometimes they can't find volunteers to be secretaries because nobody wants to take the minutes. I think that over the years we've made it into a much bigger job than it really needs to be. Um, but the minutes are important. They must be taken at every meeting and they must be made available for viewing um, anytime, as sometime in the school. So I'd like to see a hard copy. You could have a binder in the office or in the library that would hold all of your agendas and all of your minutes. If you have a bulletin board um, for parents, uh, parent caregiver information, you could stick the minutes up on the bulletin board. Um, you could post them online. If you're going to post minutes before they have been voted on for acceptance, then you want to say that when you're posting. These are the minutes from the meeting of October the 10th. They have not been voted. They will be voted uh, for acceptance at the next school council meeting. Or you can wait until after they've been voted. So your minutes would always be one meeting behind. You are required by the regulation to keep your minutes on hand for four years to be viewed easily by anyone who wants to see them. Um, of course, as I said, um, that should uh, the, the minutes should record which school council members have um, are in attendance. And if you need to have a sign and sheet so that you don't have to go, the secretary doesn't have to go and write down everybody's name. She can just take the sign in here. She can take the sign and sheet with them and to record the names of the members of school council who are absent. You do not have to record the names of any parent and caregiver guests who are at the council meeting. The minutes are a summary, a summary of what occurred at the meeting. They should be neutral, no opinion of, uh, and so-and-so gave a really dumb idea. No, 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 no. You don't want to do that. And they should be accurate. So, um, I would hope that I'm going to talk in a minute about what the report should look like, but maybe a copy of the reports could be included with the minutes. Um, they should, as I'll talk in a minute, should go out with the agenda, but you're just going to do the main points of each of each report, just the main points. You're going to record the decisions that were made either by voting or consensus. And um, if you want, who is responsible for carrying out the actions that the council um, the council has voted to do. Um, you are including in the discussion the areas of discussion. 
You don't need to say member X said blah, blah, blah. Member Y disagreed and said blah, 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 blah. You're going to want to say what the discussion is. So for example, if the discussion is about opening a garden uh, on the school grounds, uh, you would want to do a couple of reports from um, whoever is a couple of notes from whoever is putting that idea forward about why they want it and what it would look like. And then general, there was a general feeling that the, the garden would be a good idea. A few people raised concerns about who would be responsible for it. The main areas of discussion. So let's look at what minutes might look like. I have two examples. You'll see that it starts with the meeting date and time and who has um, who's attending council members and staff. Um, you want to just record that a vote or consensus agreement to approve the minutes. And then a few little notes about all of the reports um, that are made ahead, made up. Then you're going to go on to agenda items. Um, and that might be a discussion of starting a school, a school council garden. And uh, just the brief notes and then was it approved and what action is going to be taken between now and the next meeting? That's one option. Another option, this comes from the school council handbook, is the same way. It's just sort of a different uh, setup. Um, you will see on the one on the left hand side, um, there's the approval of the minutes, that there's a declaration of conflict of interest. So if anyone has a conflict of interest based on what the agenda items are, they would say so at that point. Um, then they go into old business and new business. Um, a couple of points, see the principal's report on the right-hand side. They've just done a couple of the major points and a few things about the other reports uh, and comments. Um, and then that the meeting adjourned at uh, 9 p.m. I will say at this time that the Parent and Community Engagement Office is working on a um, on a format for school council minutes, and I hope that they will be available within the next, uh, let's say, next couple of weeks. All right, so I've talked about reports a couple of times here. Um, the reports are there to advise the school council of any important issues any decisions or recommendations or any actions that have been taken. They um, will come from the principal, the chair may want to make a report, committee um, chairs may want to make a report, your teacher and non-teacher rep and your community rep, um, they may make a report if they wish, if there's something coming up that they think the council should hear about, as well as your student rep. I really strongly urge um, school council chairs to ask anyone, including the principal, who is making a report to provide a written copy of that report to go out with the agenda. As I said last night, this report, it doesn't have to be paragraphs fancy. It can just be point form notes. It can just be, um, if it's the principal, it can be, um, let's say, discipline. And if something's come up at a, at a school council, at a staff meeting that she wants to talk about, and just a couple of points, or it, um, whatever has come up. And then at the meeting, and I'll use the principal again, they would choose one or two things that they think are the most important to speak about. The reason I suggest this is that it gives everybody an opportunity to read the report ahead of time, to think about it. To, to discuss it if they want with other members of council or with the community and to have questions or ideas ready to ask the person who is giving the report. So if the principal writes out their report and then emphasizes two or three items in speaking um, to the council, then there's time for the council to discuss some of the other things that are that are contained within that. It makes um, the meeting go faster, I hope, and it, because it offers an opportunity for people to think and give some clear thought to what they want to know and to um, have a more fulsome discussion. Um, 
always leave a bit of time for questions and discussion after each report. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to decision-making. And this comes um, from the school council handbook. Members must re remember that they represent the parent caregiver community. It is their responsibility to solicit the views of the community and to encourage attendance at school council meetings to share their knowledge, ideas, and thoughts. So when an item comes up, as the chair, you will introduce the item. If there is a committee who is going to, who has been looking at the at the item, let's go back to the school garden. At a previous meeting, you decided that you would investigate uh, the possibility of having a school garden, and you formed a committee. The committee has, um, went away and talked about it, and we're going to discuss that in a few minutes. And they have come back with their recommendations. Hopefully, in the meantime, the members have been talking about this and have gotten some ideas or have encouraged people, parents and caregivers who are interested to come to the meeting. So once we get all of the facts and we have to make a decision, how do we do it? Well, one way is through consensus. The way consensus works, it requires a commitment of all members to hear alternatives and to respect the viewpoints of everyone that speaks. It benefits from the differing perspectives and from working to find common ground. I want a vegetable garden. No, 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 I want a flower garden. All right, let's talk about it. Should we do a vegetable? Should we do a flower? Can we, can we do a bit of both? What's going to work out best? The chair, you have to ensure that all participants who want to be heard are heard, members and attendees at the school council meeting. This is, this is a really important part of your job. You want to be able to be seen as being able to lead the discussion, to make sure that no one drones on, that everybody is being respectful and that everyone who wants to speak can speak. And the final decision should be seen as having everyone's support. So after the discussion, you would say, all right, that's the end of the discussion. Do we, you, are, you will, as I said earlier, summarize what you've heard. Um, what are the major points that have been said? Uh, your summarizing may help the chair, the secretary figure out what to write down too. And then you are going to um, say, do I have a consensus that we will do such and such. Here are some helpful things. And then um, if you want to formalize it with a motion or a vote, you can, and we'll discuss how in a minute. So how, as you, as a chair, how can you lead the discussion? Here are some things you can say. Let's begin by getting a reaction to everyone in the group. So Miss said, you, um, you, you spoke, can I summarize what you were saying? Or let me repeat what I think I heard this group say. Um, can I ask you, did you mean that you wanted to have one or two types of vegetables or a wide variety of vegetables? Has everyone had an option and an opportunity to express their opinion? Okay, we've had a good discussion. Let me see if I can pull together one I, from what I've heard from the majority of you that I can pull together a recommendation. If you can't, if it still seems like you can't find a consensus, okay, let's take five minutes. Let's think about our positions and maybe we need to just stop and, and, and do some statements from each other. And if you still can't reach consensus, is it the feeling of the group that we want to table this question and discuss it at the next meeting? Now, let me make clear at this point, the consensus has to occur with the members of council. The consensus does not have to occur with the, with the attendees and the participants. The members have to come to a consensus for this to work. And the members have to remember that they're there representing the parent community, the parent caregiver uh, body. So um, 
I hope I've explained this, um, this okay. If not, you can ask me some questions at the end. A more um a more direct approach approach is to have voting. This ensures that all school council members understand the process. Any member or attendee who wishes to speak to the motion should have an opportunity to do so. Members should solicit viewpoints of parent givers prior to the meeting. And decisions are made by majority vote, unlike consensus where you want to have everybody go, yeah, okay, we'll do that. It's the majority vote, 50% plus one. So how does that work? When making a motion, um, so let's stick with the garden. So the chair, uh, the chair of the gardening committee, um, after making her report and her recommendation, uh, the chair would recognize her and the member would rise and she would say, I move that our school council um, develop a, whatever it is, let's say a vegetable garden um, during this school year. The second member would stand and second the motion. It could be someone from the committee or it could be just another member of school council. Um, and agreement with the motion at this point isn't necessary. You put the motion on the table first to allow for discussion. With consensus, we discuss first and then we decided what we're gonna do with this one. We have the motion and then we have the discussion. And the secretary would record the motion in the minutes. Once there has been a fulsome discussion within the time frame um, offered, and as chair, again, you've ensured that members have been and, and participants have allowed to speak, you will, as chair, restate the motion and ensure that it has been recorded properly. Uh, discussion occurs, oh, sorry. Um, Sorry, my apologies. The, the person will make the motion. The chair will restate the motion. It will be recorded. Then um, discussion occurs. And um, please um, note that really someone should only speak twice after everyone else who wants to speak the first time has had an opportunity to do that. When the discussion is finished, the chairs ask the members if they are ready to vote. If they are ready to vote, the, mo you, the chair will restate the motion and a vote will be taken and it can be a show of hands. 50% plus one is uh, required to, um, to pass. At any time before the chair calls a vote, the person who moved it may withdraw the motion. They may say, uh, Ma Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I choose to withdraw the motion. Um, we will take it back and look at this uh, situation again and, and bring one forward at the next meeting. Now, a little bit of this, that the little added uh, sugar to this option is how to amend a motion. Before the chair calls for a vote, a member might rise and propose a change to the motion. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I would like to move to amend the motion by suggesting that we have a vegetable garden consisting of only four vegetables. The chair would ask if there are any objections. She would ask first the person who made the original motion and then the other members, are there any objections to this uh, amendment? If there are none, the change is made. And the chair ensures that the change is made and rereads the new motion. If someone objects, then you must call for a vote on the amendment. It doesn't mean the amendment is gone. It just means, all right, you know, no, I don't want to just have four vegetables. I think we should have six vegetables. As a chair, you would say, all right, we are going to have a vote all in favor of the amendment. Repeat the amendment raise your hands, you have the vote. And depending how that uh, occurs with a majority uh, vote of 50% plus one, then the amendment is included. If it's rejected, debate goes back to the original motion. And a second amendment to the motion 
may also be proposed, but a third amendment may not be. So you have the original motion, you can have one amendment, you can have two amendments, that's it. Now you have to vote on it. Sometimes the discussion around a motion can be heated. Sometimes um, it can just, you just can't decide. You can't, um, there, you, you as the chair will recognize that the room is divided. And you maybe have a very thin ma majority, but it may not be in the best interest of the council to go with it. So a vote, uh, a, a motion to table the, the um, vote may occur. If the discussion must end because more information is needed or time is running out or other business has to be discussed or you just can't agree, a motion may be made to table the motion. That may come from the chair, but it should probably come from another member of council. Uh, chair, I move that this motion be tabled. That means set aside for the next meeting. A motion to table takes um, to table motion takes precedence over any discussion of the motion. Once someone moves to table a motion, all discussion ends. It stops. All right. And I would, I'm just going to say here, I would hope that no one would use that as a tactic to stop the discussion. Um, but once a, a, a motion to table is occurred, all discussion stops. The motion to table requires a seconder. If no one will second the motion to table, then it's not tabled. You go back to the discussion. There can be no debate about a motion to table. Once you have the motion to table and a seconder, you go directly to a vote. Oops, sorry. Um, so let me just be clear on that. You, once you have voted on um, a motion to be tabled, you have the vote. If the motion succeeds, then discussion on that topic or uh, ends. If the motion doesn't succeed, you go back to the discussion back perhaps to the original motion and continue it for however long has been um, decided. Okay, so moving on, committees. There are two types of committees. There's standing committees, which are listed in your bylaws. And these, for those of you who have done your bylaws template, and those of you who have yet to do it, this is the part that you would add to the bylaws once your template comes back to you. This is the part that you would add. So it would be something, it would be a committee that has always occurred at the school and that the council today views as necessary to continue to occur for the next couple of years. So something like a budget committee or a communication committee. Remember, if you mention in your bylaws that a committee must occur, it must occur. So you may have had a garden committee for the last three years. If you put it in, you got to have a garden committee for the next couple of years until someone admits, whether you like it or not. So think very, very carefully about what committees you list in your bylaws. The next type of committees are ad hoc committees. These are created by the school council as needed. They may be a committee that occurs every single year, but every single year the, the council would vote on it and you would you would um, form the committee. So it could be a committee that looks at workshops, certain events. Um, look, here's my garden again. Um, and, and that would occur. So why do we have committees? Committees are really, really valuable for effective school councils because a lot of the work can be done at the committee level, making your school council meetings a place for decision-making and information sharing. So responsibilities are shared between you and your committees. It allows more parent caregivers to become involved because any parent caregiver at the school can sit on a committee. Every committee has to have a Count elected um, or acclaimed council member sitting on that committee, but 
others can be come on. And it's a good way to build their skills and to get other parents and caregivers involved in what's going on in council. And then maybe down the line, encourage them to run for council in a year or two. It's an opportunity for you to go out and find people who have a specialized skill set. You're doing your garden committee. Maybe there's a couple of really good gardeners that you know about that you could encourage to sit on the committee. It allows the members to gain confidence in being decision makers and leaders. And it allows matters to be examined in detail where they can sit and look and discuss um, what way they want to go and where they where they should get their resources and how they should do it. And therefore, the school council becomes more efficient because you're not dealing with all these little these little uh, details at a school council meeting. It's happening at committee. But. It is the responsibility of the school council and you as a chair or co-chair to define the purpose, the limitations, and the responsibilities of the school council. You can't just set up, okay, we're going to have a garden committee. No, the garden committee will do blah, blah, blah. We want to hear back from them by such and such a date. Um, it's setting, it's you're setting up terms of references and and if you have standing committees, you may want to include some of those in your bylaws. If it's just an ad hoc committee, then you want to have a motion uh, from your council to create that committee for this school year. As chair, you need to ensure that your committees report to school council on a regular basis. So when you're making the agenda, you're contacting the committee chairs. How's your committee doing? Um, is Are you going to make a report um, at this meeting? Can you give me a little idea of what you're going to be reporting? You're not reporting at this meeting? Okay, why not? Great. Final decisions are made by the school council. They are not made by the committee. The committee comes to council with their recommendations and the reasons behind it, and then the school council votes to accept the recommendations to reject the recommendations or to accept some of them and maybe um, through discussion decide to change it a little bit. Volunteers. Let me speak for just a minute about volunteers. So important um, for the work that you do and for the work that may be um, occurring in the school outside of school council. It's always a nice um, offer by school council to say, you know, we're looking for volunteers to ask the principal, would, do you foresee places where you would need volunteers? Do you need volunteers in the classroom? Can we help, help do that? So here are my recommendations for volunteers. First, collect the names and the contact information for any parent and caregiver in the school who is interested in volunteering at the school and also where their areas of interest lie. Um, and you can do that, as I should say, you can do that either, you can send out a volunteer survey and I have a, I have a sample one, you can't, you, you would just use it to create your own survey, but if you want one, write to me and ask me for it. Um, but you could do a sur an online survey um, when you've got a school event or like a um, parent teacher night or the um, meet the teacher night or anything, music night, um, stand there and have a table where you're looking for volunteers. So you've got your list of volunteers. The next thing you wanna do is make a list of where do we need volunteers? If we're going to have a, um, a workshop on um, literacy, um, are we going to need any volunteers for that? Are we going to need somebody who will get the refreshments and hand them out? Um, are we going to need volunteers to make up the, the notices the, or flyers to go out for it? Um, do we need volunteers in the classroom? Uh, do we need volunteers on field trips? Uh, where do we need them? So you've got a list of people who want to be volunteers. You've got a list of places where you will need the volunteers. and then and this is the work for a volunteer committee, um, then you meld the two together. 
too often we get our volunteers and we just say, yeah, go, you're doing that. Go do that. And we don't give them any training, especially the volunteers that are working in the school. Um, first of all, they have to have their police report done. And second, what do they need to know if they're going to volunteer in a classroom? If you're having a bake sale, what do they need to know if they're volunteering to work in the bake sale? Do they do they know that they need to put the prices on on every all the items? Uh, do they need to know anything about the items that are coming in? What do they need to know? Make sure that they feel confident in in their job. Check in with them if you can um, throughout the course of the job that they're doing. How's it going? Is if, if you're having a fun fair and you've got volunteers at that, have someone go around. How's it going? Is, is everything working out okay? If um, they're volunteering in the classroom, how's it working? Is, are you enjoying working in the classroom? Is there anything you don't understand? So that they feel valued, they feel listened to. And finally, thank them. You don't have to write out thank you cards all the time. Just going up to someone and saying, thank you so much for volunteering for our bake sale. Thank you so much for volunteering on this committee, um, whatever. Don't forget to thank your volunteers so that they will come back to you. And now we're coming to the end and we're going to end with conflict. So I've mentioned a couple of times conflict of interest. A conflict of interest for a school council representative is any situation in which the individual's private interest may be incompatible or in conflict with their school council responsibilities. The conflict may be actual, it may be perceived, or there may be a potential for conflict. So let me give you an example. I'll stick with my garden committee. And you know that the Smiths down the street um, and, and, and one of the Smiths sits on council that they own a nursery and they sell, the, or, or let's say they own a convenience store and they sell uh, plants at their convenience store. And part of the discussion that's going to come up for a vote or a consensus agreement is where you should get the plants for your garden. That is, it could be an actual conflict of interest if someone says, oh, let's get it from the Smith's convenience store. It could be perceived because maybe that Mr. or Mrs. Smith, who's ever sitting on council, would vote against getting it from uh, the metro state, the metro store, or there could be a potential. So what has to occur is the member looking at the agenda ahead of time, seeing what's coming up, recognizing, reading the report, perhaps recognizing there could be a vote that could possibly be a conflict of interest, should declare at the meeting, either at the beginning of the meeting or when the item comes up, that they have a conflict or potential conflict of interest, and that they will refrain from participating in this discussion, and they will not vote on any motion or consensus that comes forward. Okay, pretty simple. If it looks like you or your family could benefit in any way from the vote, then you refrain from discussing that or voting on that particular item. All right, so now we move to conflict resolution. And um, this is one of the responsibilities listed in Regulation 612 for school council chairs. And I think, to be honest with you, that it is quite possibly the one item, the one responsibility that you as a leader within your council in your school um, may be the most uncertain about. Um, conflict is never fun and not knowing how to handle it uh, doesn't make it any better. One of the reasons these modules are being put together for you to consider yourself a leader, to to see yourself as leading within the council, within, within the school, I hope is to make you feel a little more 
comfortable in what you can or should do should a conflict arise within your council. So I'm going to take you through some of the major points um, within the um, the, the bylaws template. Uh, there was a very long section on conflict resolution. It's probably, it is the most detailed section uh, in the bylaws. There were a number of various options um, that you could choose. And so if you haven't done it, Yet, think very carefully. If you have, um, you may want to review that section of your bylaws every year. If only that you as the chair or co-chair or vice chair feel more confident in what to do. So let's go through some of them. So some of the general principles of conflict resolution. It's in places of conflict that the potential for change exists. And all of our ideas, conflicting ideas, are offer great learning and growth opportunities for each other if we are able to do a respectful dialogue. There are many forms of oppression that aren't always easy to, acknowledge, to recognize, and it's imperative that we acknowledge this and that we take responsibility for any biases, conscious or unconscious, that we may have and any expectations that we may hold of a particular person or a particular um, uh, topic of discussion. We all bear responsibility for upholding a safer place and we are all accountable to each other. We do not have to exclude each other or abandon each other. If we're willing to learn, we are here to help each other through the process of unlearning and then changing any structures that might perpetuate a conflict or an oppression. School councils have the authority to enter into conflict resolution with any member of school council using the procedures outlined in the template. And in instances of discrimination or harassment, School council members in consultation with the principal or the superintendent shall pursue policy uh, P034 with workplace harassment, prevention of non-human rights code harassment, rather than an internal conflict resolution process. So if there's any discrimination or harassment based on discrimination, you would go to your principal or superintendent and work through it using policy P034. So how can we manage conflict? When there's a conflict between co-chairs and the council, it will be facilitated by an executive officer. So either the secretary or the treasurer. So if co-chairs are having a dispute with each other or the co-chairs are having a dispute with the rest of the council, the secretary or the treasurer would be responsible facilitating the, the conflict resolution. If the conflict is between the principal and the school council, the, it will be facilitated by the superintendent in collaboration with the co-chair. That means as a co-chair, you would go to your superintendent, you would inform them of the conflict, what has happened and what, what has occurred and what you may have tried to do, and then work with them on how can you facilitate a resolution between the chair and the principal. If the conflict is between the chair, um, and I've said that, it, oh, I've repeated myself, sorry about that. If the conflict is between executives, um, executive members, so between the co-chair and the secretary, it's the co-chair and the treasurer, the treasurer and the secretary, it will be precipitated by the principal in consultation with the superintendent. So how does this look? Um, if a conflict occurs at a school council meeting, the co-chair will call for order no more than three times. So if someone is a, a member or a participant stands up and they are um, 
being very aggressive, if they won't stop talking, if they um, are behaving in a way that is contrary to the code of conduct, you may call for order three times. I'm sorry, I'm calling for order. Please resume your seat. I, now, let's begin again. And then it, again, again. After three times, if the person continues to um, be in conflict with the council, then the council may seek, the chair may seek approval from the council to remove the parties that are in conflict with the council. They remove them from the meeting, citing the request, the reasons for the request. All right. This person, I move that this person be removed from the meeting. They have been asked three times to come to order. They have not. They must leave the meeting. All in, uh, may I have a seconder for the motion? All in favor? If they vote 50% 50, 50 um, 50 plus one, then they, the person must leave the meeting. This does not stop them from participating in future meetings. This holds for whether it's a member or a participant, right? Three times a warning. If the war, if the war, if the warning is not heeded, as the chair, you may ask that the person be removed from the meeting. You must record and submit the incident to the superintendent within one week of the meeting via the principal. So you would record it. You would give make a. Um, type up a, a letter um, saying what happened, give it to the principal, the principal would give it to the superintendent. The school council chair in collaboration with the principal shall request that the member or members participate in a private meeting with the chair chairs and the principal to arrive at a resolution for the dispute. The meeting will result, this meeting will result in clear steps to be taken by each party. So if you are able to resolve it in a mutually acceptable way, the council agrees to do this. The, the person who was removed up because of conflict will agree to do this. And the code, the chair of coaches will provide an update of the resolution at the next formal meeting of school council. What isn't included here, and, and I'm sorry, I, sh I should have included it in. If you vote to remove the person who is disrupting the meeting, to remove them from, from the meeting, and they refuse to leave, then as the chair, you may immediately adjourn the meeting. I know you may say, oh, but you know, it's halfway through the meeting. We've got all these items. They have to be taken care of. No, they don't. No, they don't. You cannot have a meeting where someone is disrupting it. I have seen too many councils where someone has been disruptive meeting after meeting and the council disintegrates. No one wants to come. No one wants to participate. So if it's in the best interest of your council to end a meeting, then you as a leader may do that. And you can call for a vote to end the meeting or you can just unilaterally do it. If a resolution is not possible when the, the parties meet, the chair may call for a special meeting of the school council to review the dispute or the conflict and explore options that may include suspension of the member or the attendee. So even though I said that it doesn't participate, it doesn't, um, the, the first removal of them from the meeting doesn't preclude them from coming back to future meetings. But if you get together and you try to work out a resolution and they just will not cooperate, you cannot find a resolution at all, then you go to, to the council and you vote to have them suspended for a certain amount of time. I'm not going to, I haven't gone into that part. That is very clear in the template, how, how long you can remove them from. So um, you might want to review that. Let me be clear though. If someone is suspended, if, a, if it's a member that's suspended and they're suspended from attending the next meeting or two, um, they still remember, remain a meeting. 
Regulation 612 does not in any way allow for the removal of a member from their position. Once they are elected or acclaimed, they are a member for the rest of the school of the school year. They may choose to resign, um, but uh, that has to be their choice. They cannot be asked to, the res to resign. Okay, so that's that's it for um, today's. The next um, module, and I knew there was something I forgot. It was the date. I believe it's at the end of October. Um, we'll be looking at um, councils, traditional councils and engagement, and how that's led to a feeling of the hard to reach amongst some of our parents and caregivers, and how we can disrupt this myth of hard to reach parents. We're going to look at relationships and communications, and we're going to look at how you as a school council chair can lead your council to go to the margins of your community and bring those people that you don't hear from very often, bring them in and hear what they're saying. And we're going to look at the various ways that councils um, must consult, um, not only with their community, but around the school improvement plan and around the school statement of needs. I'll leave you with this quote about conflict. When you have a conflict, that means that there are truths that have to be addressed on each side of the conflict. And when you have a conflict, then it's an educational process to try to resolve the conflict. And to resolve that, you have to get people on both sides of the conflict involved so that they can dialogue. Okay. We're going to go to um, questions now. So uh, what's the difference between leading via quorum um, versus consensus? All right, well, a quorum is um, how many people you have to have um, at your meeting for the meeting to be legal. And we discussed that last night. I'll go over it quickly for those of you who weren't here. Uh, your quorum has to be 50% uh, plus one of your membership. And the majority of that has to be parents. If you don't have quorum, you can hold a meeting, but you can't make any decisions. Uh, consensus is when you have quorum and everybody is there and you are, you are discussing it. So quorum is important for vote taking, but it's also important so that you can have a meeting. Oh, if if I didn't answer it, um, just ask me something else to clarify. Are we able to request a hard copy of the council handbook? There aren't any hard copies anymore, unless there's one hiding in your school. Um, but if you go to Google and you just um, put in Ontario School Council Handbook, you should be able to get it. The alternative is to go to the Ministry of Education website and um, put in the search engine school council handbook and you should be able to get an electronic copy. I wish there were hard copies, but there aren't. Last night, you mentioned that the reports could be sent out with the agenda. Do we need to have council approve this change in process or is this an okay process change that the chairs can implement? That's a really good question. I always like to be, and I always say to councils, they should be transparent, they should be accountable, and they should be inclusive in everything that they do. So if I stick to that, I would say that I would say to your council, um, even, you know, I, I was at a training session and this is what they suggested, and I think it would be really great for our council. What do you think? And, and, and run it by them. Um, but you could you could try it. You could try it on your own, on your own initiative. Um, maybe even discuss it with your executive so that this isn't a unilateral um, decision. Discuss it with your executive and give it a try. And then at the meeting, you could say, look, this is what we tried. The executive tried. What do you think? Shall we continue with this process? Um, are these uh, documents available on the PCO website? Um, I'm not sure what documents you mean. If you're talking about the bylaws, yes, it is available on the website. You would um, 
go to um, school councils on the website and down the left-hand side, you'll see bylaws and you can get it there. Um, let me know what other documents you're talking about. Um, does the whole committee need to attend um, a meeting? All right, so if we're talking about the school council, then as many school, school council members, one of their responsibilities is to attend every meeting. Sometimes you just can't, life happens. Um, but if a school council member misses more than two meetings, as a chair, you should be contacting them and saying, is everything okay? You've missed the last two meetings. Um, what's, you know, is there anything that, that we can do to encourage you to come to the meetings? Because we really need you there. Um, as for a subcommittee of council, um, then if you join a subcommittee, I would hope that you would attend the meetings. Again, stuff happens. Um, whoever is chairing the committee, as you have done, should be contacting the people who have signed up and aren't showing up at meetings. Committee meetings, I should have said, can occur anywhere. They can occur in um, they can occur in the school. Uh, they could occur at, um, take place at a Starbucks or a Tim Hortons or whatever. Um, but they should occur where everybody is comfortable. So sometimes someone might say, "Oh, you know, I'm going to have it at my house." Well, there might be people for whatever reason aren't comfortable in going to somebody's house. Uh, that is a decision that should be made by everybody on the committee, and they should be able to freely, um, without fear of, of how it would look, say where they feel comfortable meeting. Um, okay. Is there a conflict check requirement through TDSB before we hire someone on our own? Do we need to verify if there is a required TDS vendor beforehand? You must use TDSB vendors. And you can find those um, online. Um, if, yeah, I, I'm, I leave this to the finance people. <laughs> I, the finance stuff, I'll admit up now, is not one of my strengths. Um, but I do know that you are required to use TDSB approved vendors. So even, and so that's a good question actually, even if Mr. and Mrs. Smith's uh, convenience store is a TDSB vendor, uh, they would still have a conflict if you were voting about using them um, for, some, for something for the council and they would still have to uh, declare a conflict of interest and remove themselves from discussion and votes. How does a conflict of interest impact quorum? Oh, there's a good question. If you had enough with all members present and when you had to remove one and now you don't have quorum, does that mean the vote cannot take place? Yes, it does. And herein lies the reason that we want to make, last night I suggested having 10 members so that you would always have enough parent members to cover quorum. Um, this is why it's really important that you, your bylaws allow for a, a, a workable number of parents, that you have a workable number of parents, that if you didn't get enough in election, that you then look around and find somebody who you could talk into doing it, who would come and take responsibility, and you could appoint them. So that that's a really good question. I have never been asked that question before. But yeah. If you have a conflict of interest and you are down to like there's only one more parent over the other ones, then then um, they you can't vote on that issue. I'm afraid that's a really good question. Does a conflict resolution process only apply for conflict that occurs in live council meetings? Good question. No. If there is conflict at any time between the chair and the principal, if there's conflict between the executive, there's conflict at any time between chairs and members, between member and member, it still is conflict resolution. It must be resolved and the council chair is responsible for it and the process must be followed. The next webinar is scheduled for October 26th. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, this is a date of our school council's parent-teacher interviews. Oh no. Is that the same with other schools? If so, could you please reschedule? Um, let me know. Uh, write to me and let me know. Um, I'm going to um, 
I, I don't know if I'm going to see if I can put my email in chat. Um, just give me one minute. There we go. Um, the other thing is that these four webinars are going to be repeated in November and you don't have to take them in any particular order. So it, it's been really, really difficult to schedule these four. I'm kind of thinking it's going to be almost impossible to reschedule um, the third one. Um, between the days of significance and stuff that's happening in the board, it was really difficult to uh, do it. But um, you could take the third one in November. Uh, yeah. From yesterday, is the community member mandatory or just recommended? Mandatory. Mandatory. The regulations put in that there has to be a community member, so it's mandatory. Um, but as I said yesterday, wait until, as a council, in the first um, meeting or two, you have set out your goals and objectives and then figure out who in the community would best um, help you reach those um, those things. And as I said before too, you could have two people share the job. Can I confirm, did you mention that the agenda should be posted, distributed prior to the date of the next meeting? Yes, everybody on council should receive a copy of the agenda, hopefully a week before. Um, but also I would post it if there's a, a school council bulletin board, put it, put it up there. If you have a website that people um, know to go to, put it on that, uh, but make it available. Yes. Uh, what's the best way to manage parents that demand that their issues be discussed as priority of, of, the, of the meeting at the start of the meeting? When their issue does not affect a large group of children and have already been given information regarding their question. There is a um, family engagement um, expert down in the States that I like, and he says that it's he, he was at one time a principal and then a superintendent and then a director of education, excuse me. He says in his experience, <clears throat> when parents and caregivers are angry, the anger is a shield for their fear they're really scared. They're worried. They're worried that their child won't succeed. They're worried that something's happening to their child. They're worried. And he said, once he was able to understand that, it was easier for him to deal um, with the parent and with the conflict. That said, um, as I mentioned last night, um, the regulations preclude no personal issue may be brought to the floor of a school council meeting. Um, I used discipline last night as an example um, that if a parent is disturbed about how their child is being disciplined or how discipline is being meted out in this child's classroom, they cannot come to a school council meeting and say, I don't like how discipline is being handled in Miss little Mr. So-and-so's room, and I wanted to stop in this case. That can't happen. What they can do is they can come to um, the chair or they can say at a meeting, um, I would like some information on um, the discipline structures or the discipline philosophy in this school. And what can we as parents and caregivers um, expect that our children will be expected of our children and how they will be disciplined. What can we tell them um, that this, this is the way it, it, it goes. Um, I know some schools have a particular discipline philosophy. They tell their parents about it so that the parents maybe can copy some of those practices at home. So um, I sort of branched off there that said, so you cannot bring a personal issue to the floor of the school. You can ask that the broader issue be discussed at a council meeting. As a chair, you are, you are responsible for ensuring that you and your members are known to the school community, that the school community feels comfortable coming to you or a member and saying, I have a concern about this. Is this something that could be discussed at a school council meeting? And then you have to stick with that. And if a parent gets up and starts arguing at the beginning of the meeting, I want to talk about this, you say, 
look, I understand that this is an important issue for you. And if you want to talk about it generally, we could add it to the list of new business. And if we have time at the end of the of what's scheduled, we could bring it up. If not, please speak to me afterwards and um, let's see how, how, how we can work this out. And maybe what it means is that you suggest to them, I think you need to go and talk to the principal, make an appointment with the principal. I will advise them that you have talked to me and, and hopefully that can work out. So I hope tomorrow that that helps in some ways. Um, um, where can we find last night's talk? Um, hopefully by the end of next week, it will be up on the TDSB PCEO um, YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube, and you type in, I believe it's PCEO TDSB, um, a whole pile of workshops come up. Um, and you should be able to see last year's workshops were done in sort of primary colors and it said school council across. That's how you knew it was, it was these. I meant the documents you had shown. Oh, those documents. Um, a couple of them are available in the school council handbook. Um, give me a minute. I can tell you what page I think. Um, no, of course, I'm not going to be able to find it quickly, am I? But if you go to the school council handbook, you'll find a couple of um, examples of minutes and agendas. And as I said, the parent community engagement office is coming out with a sample um, minute format, and that hopefully will be out in the next week or two. And I not sure to tell you the truth if they will be sending it to councils or if it will just be available on the school council page. Who will pay for council meeting stationary example prints? Oh, good question. So for those of you who don't know, on budget line, the school's budget line, 41,500, every school council gets $1.25 per student minimum of $300 for small schools, maximum of $1,000 for larger schools. That money has been set aside for the TDS, from the TDSB to pay for school, so that school council can function. You can use that money for paper. You can use it for refreshments. You can use it for child minding. Um, you can use it if you have, if you're running some workshops and you wanna hand stuff out. Um, that's where that money is. It's on the school's budget line. That means that the principal and the OA are responsible for that money. So what may have to happen in discussions with your OA or with your principal is you may have to spend the money first, then hand in the receipts and be, be reimbursed for them. But ask them um, what works best for them. Again, that's budget line 41500. Also on that budget line is $500 from the Ministry of Education. That's to be used for parent outreach. It's not to be used for supplies or anything, but that's if you're going to hold some seminars or some workshops or you're going to have a newsletter or, or whatever, um, it's for parent outreach. I have recently become chair of my council and I have not received nor have I seen any bylaws from our past chair. Do all councils have bylaws and are they different from the code of conduct? All councils should have bylaws. Uh, they The template came out probably a year and a half ago. Originally, they were to be in by January of this year. Um, if you write to me, um, I will be able to tell you if bylaws were sent in. If the new bylaws have not been sent in, either you didn't know about it or you've been putting it off, please, please, please make it the first item of business of your school council this year. The first ad hoc committee you create is to be, is a bylaw committee. They will look at the 12 or 13 options, decide which ones work best for the school, come to the council with their suggestions, and then it's voted on. The whole process is available on the bylaws page of the TDSB website. Um, oh, Lisa, it's having parent teacher, okay. I, my only suggestion, I will look and see if there's another date, but my only suggestion is see if you could come to the third one in November. 
Um, I believe conflict is not negative. We should encourage members to express their concerns so that we get an opportunity to learn from different perspectives and go together. What are your thoughts? Oh, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. We can't, we would not be in a, we would not be able to grow and change and become better if we didn't disagree with each other. What co conflict that is discussed in the bylaws and in, um, in, in, in the regs is when it becomes very aggressive and it stops dialogue, it stops relationships, it, it doesn't, it's not, it's not grounded in respect and nothing moves forward. Um, we can't have a conflict like that. We have to always strive to find um, a resolution. But in the meantime, sit in our discomfort and try to learn from those around us, um, like we do with our kids every day. Um, our principal says if we do hybrid meeting, only one person votes will be only in person votes will be counted. Uh, no, that's not correct. No, 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 no. If you are having a hybrid meeting, um, the people who are coming in online can vote online. There's a voting app on Zoom. Um, most schools now are moving to um, um, meets. And that, I think that's what it's called. And um, the app on that is uh, called Polly, uh, P-O-L-L-Y. And they should look for that. Uh, you have to be in attendance. You have, when I say you have to be in attendance, I mean, you either have to be at the meeting in person or online. You can't vote uh, by proxy or, or send your vote in or vote by email. Um, oh. The presentation from last night is already posted. Somebody says, yay, Margaret. Is there any way for school council to have access to a council page on school website so things like agenda minutes can be shared? Are there any other ways to make content more accessible to, a to all parents? Um, <clears throat> yes, you would have to, if your school has a website, um, and most do, um, you would need to talk to um, your OA um, and ask because they would be the ones or whoever posts stuff on them would have to post your stuff. You would not be able to personally uh, post your stuff on the school council's website. But that's a discussion um, and a collaboration with your principal um, about how can you do that. Um, again, I really like school council bulletin boards in a place where a, uh, there's high traffic of, of um, parents and caregivers. Um, other ways to make content more accessible. Um, sometimes it comes down to surveying your parent community. Um, some communities, WhatsApp works really well uh, for them. Other communities, um, it might be um, might be a Facebook page. Um, I hesitate to. Um, some schools use Twitter. Um, then it becomes very public um, if, if other people slip into it. So I'm not, um, or I should say X, um, so that I'm hesitant to uh, suggest that. Um, you know, that's a good discussion at a council meeting. Does people have suggestions of how we could make our information more accessible to you? Um, what way could we do it? You could take some of the money that you get on that budget line 41500 and you could have a regular newsletter. Um, and, and that could go out. Um, there are different um, apps that do newsletters. Um, this one I used, I think, not Canva. There's, there's a couple of different apps that you can, can do to do that too. So I'm not, oh, oh, there's one more. If a member misses three straight meetings, are they automatically removed from school council? No, no member can be removed from school council for any reason. No reason. They can be arrested and sent to jail, and they cannot be removed as a school council meet as a school council member. The only way they can come off school council is if they choose of their own free will to resign. Now, what you could do is meet with them and say, listen, you've missed three meetings. We're only having six this year. Um, we're like, I was really happy to have you, but um, do you feel that this is something that you are able to do um, this year? Or 
would you do you feel that maybe you should resign and if things get better next year you could you could run again um, but you can't say to them I want you to resign um, you can't remove them um, you just if they you just don't vote for them next if they run again uh, would be would be my suggestion so no other questions. Um, again, if you have any questions that come up to you afterwards, please, um, I put my email in the in the chat. Uh, please feel free to, to write me and I will try to respond to you as, as quickly as I can. Um, as I said to everyone last night, I want to take this um, opportunity to thank you most sincerely for um, all of the work that you do for your council for choosing to be leaders um, in your school and in the education system, um, for working for the mandate of school councils, for pupil achievement, and to make the system accountable to uh, parents and caregivers. What you do is not easy. I know that, um, but it is important. It makes a profound difference in the lives of your parents and caregivers and in the lives of your children. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you for coming this evening. And um, I hope to see you October 26th, or if it's changed to a new date, um, or at the next, um, at the next um, one of the modules. And have a really uh, great evening. Thank you.